we basically work from like a 12 week out into the race starting to engage with the local team starting to kind of get our workforce program off the ground but if you think about it i'm working on 10 different races mm. so like the stages that i'm at for each race is all really different so yeah, i'm at a kind different of like a lag yeah so i'm at a different so, stage for each race so yeah. i might be having like a kickoff meeting so i have a potentially have a kickoff meeting for berlin this week mm. but i'm in the final stages of planning for sao paulo that was emma pete event workforce manager at formula e Unlike traditional motorsports, Formula E cars are powered solely by electricity, making it an environmentally friendly alternative to conventional racing. On today's episode, Emma will give a behind the scenes look at Formula E events, including the recruitment, training and coordination of volunteers. You'll learn about the unique challenges and rewards of managing a volunteer workforce in the high paced world of electric car racing. If you're curious about the intersection of motorsports, sustainability, and volunteerism, be sure to tune in to discover how Formula E utilizes the power of volunteers to drive success both on and off the track. This is the Engaged Volunteer Podcast, and I'm hosting today. My name is Martin O'Neill from Rostify, and I have Emma Pete from Formula E with me. Hi. Hello. Hello. <laughs> and I want to kick off really, Emma, with you just talking about your role. And if you could describe God. what your role actually is, that would be great. Yeah, well, I feel like it changes daily. Um, so Formula E has been around, we're actually in our 10th season now. And the workforce remit has only actually existed since I started in Formula E 18 months ago. So mm -hmm. I was the first person into the workforce remit. In the past, all of the temporary staffing resource was kind of onboarded by our event project management team. It was very much like get an agency, fill the roles, do it with the least operational like and, headache. And do you pay possible. for that when you do that? Do you pay for like temp staff to, yeah. to do that? And then in season five, Formula E started wanting to move more towards using volunteers. <laughs> you know as well as I do that volunteers take a little bit more love, a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. um, so slowly Formula E were kind of like, they wanted to build out this volunteer program and the workforce program whilst we were building up this big calendar of events. And they quickly realized that they actually needed a person dedicated to this role rather than event project management doing it on top of all of their other stuff. Gotcha. Yeah. So 18 months ago, I started in the event workforce role. And since then, I've actually managed to get Formula E to hire another person for me because we've realized that if we want to be rolling out more of a volunteer program, yeah. it takes a lot more time. We've got a lot more races every year as well. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of where we're sitting. We're trying to build out a pretty robust volunteer program across all of our calendar of events. Some races, that doesn't really work. Um, Have you calendar. always got a suitcase packed? Oh yeah, right. I'm packed. <laughs> Basically from like January through till August, I'm more or less away at all of the races. Yeah. But yeah, just managing the temporary staff plan and rolling out through a hybrid of volunteer and paid staff on the ground. Yeah. Can I talk a little bit about Formula E before we jump into like... Yeah, uh... a disclaimer though. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't even like heard of Formula E before I started. Yeah, that was yeah. exactly what I was going to ask you mm. because I... So I'm a bit of a motorsport nerd and I love... Oh, nice. Yeah, I love Formula One. But right, okay. I will mm -hmm. be honest with you, I wasn't watching Formula E. However, <laughs> yeah, no, well, you beat me to it because two things happened. One, they started promoting it a lot more during Formula One broadcasting. And I thought, mm. okay, I might want to check this out yeah. as well. And then I also discovered, well, I say discovered, Google tells me that it's also the fifth most watched sport, mass participation sport mm. in the world, which is incredible when you think of how many different like major sports there are yeah. out there and it's growing really really fast and that is it must be very exciting for you to be part of something that is on the upward trajectory not just like a heritage sport that everybody's yeah. heard of but mm -hmm. actually be part of something not at the ground level because it's like been around for a bit but you're definitely on that upward climb at the moment 100%. in terms of popularity and that. yeah it's really exciting i think i can't remember which motorsport we took over but yeah we overtook i think it was 
again, don't hold me to this. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we overtook Nas Car in terms of popularity last year and viewing figures. Mm. Um, so yeah, we're definitely on an upward tilt. And I think part of that is because it's not just about motorsport, our story. It's also that sustainability story as well. Yeah. It's a bit more multifaceted. I mean, the fact that we're only 10 years old and we're already up here is like incredibly <laughs> exciting and it's only going to keep going keep really yeah. yeah so sorry to put you on the spot with this one oh, but God. like <laughs> do you know how many different locations that formula, formula e has e. In, in its calendar yeah so i mean this season we've got 10 different race locations right so that is the same as we were last year yeah i think probably next year we'll have 11 do they use a lot of the same and... circuits or do they have to make specific circuits for formula e so one of the selling points of Formula E as well is that we're like a city centre racing mm -hmm. series, which is incredibly exciting, but yeah. it means we're a bit of a travelling circus and we basically plonk ourselves on like the city streets. We're not on like a set racetrack. Mm. We're moving more from that kind of setup to more of like a hybrid. So we are using some racetracks. So this year we're at Portland International Raceway in America. We're at Misano. So we've moved from city racing in Rome mm. in Italy to a Misano circuit. Mm. In Mexico, we also use a circuit. So we're moving more towards set circuits. It's pretty exciting in the lives that you touch when you're in a city center racing circuit. Yeah, That gives you so it's much more exposure energy, and it's exciting. It? Mm. However, the way that the cars are going and the way they're progressing as well, we're so much quicker now. Yeah. And it's actually, we can use our cars more when we're on a set circuit. We can yeah. go quick and we can, you know, it's yeah. just getting a little bit dangerous when you're on a city like Rome. And like you basically, it's a little bit dangerous. Well, even just driving in Rome now. is dangerous, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so going to like you arriving at Formula E, mm. can I go back a little bit? Because I kind of like looked and you were kind of like focused. Would it right be fair to say in sort of retail sort of space? I know that when you studied, you did a dissertation on retail and it looked mm -hmm. like things were going in that direction for yeah. you. How comes you've gone as a bit of a pivot and into this? It's quite interesting. I don't even know. I think, you know, sometimes you just like drop into a job and you kind of realise that you don't really like it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but you've like developed skills and you've found new passions whilst you're doing that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, basically when I was at uni, I did, I mean, initially I was meant to do geology at Edinburgh. Okay. And then I took a gap year. Right. And then I was like, oh, I think I would want something like a little bit more practical, gives me a bit more breadth. Yeah. So then I did business studies at university. And then my first job was basically in customer service in a retail job. So I worked for Hush Homeware. Mm -hmm. And while I was there, I kind of realized I didn't really like the job I was in. Sure? But I wanted to get more into marketing. So I did some work with the marketing team, did some like brand launches. And then my next job was in event marketing. So you've got the marketing element, mm -hmm. but it's more events. Mm -hmm. Then the job after that was events. So like, I don't know, it's just yeah, like a I step. I, I was getting you're... experience doing other stuff going like, oh, maybe I'm not enjoying this element. However, yeah. this part of the job I like. But even like looking back at the first job I had in customer service, I gained so much amazing experience in that role that I still take into my job today. Mm -hmm. And like the marketing element, all of the stuff I did in marketing is so important when you're doing volunteer programs. So like every single job that I've had since then, it might not have been the right thing, but it's got me to the right place now. Yeah. And the skills and everything that I've learned in all of the different roles have just been so incredible. So yeah. Yeah, I know it's really hard to answer this question, but what does a <laughs> typical week sort of look like for you? Because <laughs> yeah. I know this can be really varied, but yeah. like, if you were to paint a picture of like, you know. <laughs> Just trying to think what my week's been like. So I basically have a, like a three month lead in to each race, which doesn't feel like a lot, but we basically work from like a 12 week out into the race, starting to engage with the local team, starting to kind of get our workforce program off the ground. But if you think about it, I'm working on 10 different races. Mm. So like, the stages that I'm at for each race is all really different. So yeah, I'm at a kind different- Kind of like a lag? Yeah, so I'm at a different so, stage for each race. So yeah. I might be having like a kickoff meeting. So I have a, potentially have a kickoff meeting for Berlin this week, hmm. but I'm in the final stages of planning for Sao Paulo. Okay. So and when you say I'm doing planning everything. for Sao Paulo, <laughs> do you mean planning the event team, like the volunteers that will be there? Yeah. And like, have you got to organize like logistics of getting them to the venue yeah. and the communication? Mm -hmm. and are those yeah, the so elements it, that... Yeah, it's basically the full volunteer program. So if we look at that 12-week period, the initial week is me basically speaking to all of the Formula E team internally that need staff, understanding the staffing requirements, 
then getting a read of the local market in terms of how we're going to fill that staff like mm. is it feasible for us to do a volunteer program here what type of roles if we were going to use volunteers here would those volunteers be happy to do because that's different with each culture and each market as well mm -hmm. and then you're kind of locking down the requirements going out and recruiting volunteers recruiting paid staff vetting them you know doing the whole onboarding process and then you're thinking about operational delivery right we've got the people now how are we going to get them on site? How are we going to clothe them? How are we going to feed them? Where are we going to do it? You know, understanding the spaces when you're in a different circuit every week. Because mm. so when you're in Tokyo, the permit deadline was back in like January. So you've got to do your permits for like a tent outside the venue. Like it's... How do you keep that the whole thing? Right? <laughs> Not very well. No, <laughs> no I'm joking. It's quite hard because... Even my driver's license yeah. expired. I don't know how you do. <laughs> I know, and then you've got to do your visa. <laughs> it's quite interesting you asked that as well, actually, because... In the past, I've always, always worked in silo, always done the job on my own. Mm -hmm. So like last season and since I started at Formula E, it's just been me doing everything. So like everything's in my brain and it's organized in the way my brain wants to organize it. Mm -hmm. And I've always Single got the- Single point of failure. Yeah. I can say <laughs> I've always got the job done. <laughs> but then I am lucky enough to have onboarded a workforce coordinator, which is amazing. She started in January. All of a sudden, I've got to take everything that's in my brain and mm. brief it into her in a way that she can deliver the events as well. Yeah. So she's leading on Tokyo for the first race this year, which is really exciting. Actually got confirmed. We have 300 volunteers signed up to Tokyo, nice. which is exciting. That happened this morning. How but do you yeah. recruit? Is it just like, hey, we're going to be here and everybody just goes nuts and wants to be part of it and signs up? It varies, up, or... yeah. So again, it hugely varies per market. Basically what I do when I start first liaising with like a local team in each market is just understanding that market and that culture. So for example, we had a 30 year volunteer program in Saudi this year, which is really exciting. But we only started with 30 volunteers there just to do a test bed to prove that it would work. And the way that we did that is actually just reached out to like volunteers that we already know in the market mm. and started using them. You know, your existing network, use them, prove that it would work. Yeah. But then in Tokyo, we went, no, let's just go ham, let's do it. <laughs> So we just set up the event on Rostify, basically got a link live and then have just shared it through all of our existing network. We put a deadline of that link as the 25th of February, because after that point, it would be hard for us to backfill with paid staff. Sure. So that's that's often how we work it. Like if we haven't got the appetite and if the volunteer program is not going to work, we still need to staff the event. So of course we you use do. paid yeah. staff. Have you got a legal requirement to have a minimum number of people at the location? So the staff that I mainly work with are like, it's more like spectator experience. Mm -hmm. So it's not a legal requirement. We're so not, not like, like security or staff. Health and safety no. or like that. We're on like the fun side, the spectator <laughs> experience, event experience side okay. of things. So it's not a legal requirement from our side, but it is definitely something that we deem as quite important yeah, to the success of our yeah. event. Yeah. So yeah, and then basically what we do is sometimes we'll like liaise with local charities, local universities, but also there's so many people in the Formula E team that are working in that market. Mm. They have so many contacts. So a lot of times I'm like, comms team, marketing team, can you just share it? You've already done the hard work. Yeah. Just share my link. Yeah, yeah. You have the network. <laughs> yeah, you you've got done the, the networking. <laughs> and like, there's no point us all doubling up the work. Sure. Like they've already established amazing. Mm. And then for example, in Tokyo, that's obviously the base market for Nissan. Mm -hmm. So we've reached out to Nissan as a partner in that market. And we've said, do you want us to hold X amount of volunteer places for you? And you can put it out to your team in Tokyo. So mm -hmm. there's various ways that we can fill it, which is part of the exciting thing. No race is the same. It's yeah. part of the challenge as well. And you, when, you, <laughs> when you said about the Rostify link, you mean like a landing page mm -hmm. for the events. Mm -hmm. I presume because you've got an international calendar, you don't necessarily put all the the international events that you've got on there but you might get the odd volunteer that's like got crazy air miles and just wants to go all over the world but yeah we're looking at how we're going to do it going forward so Mia who I've onboarded she's going to be looking after kind of like the volunteer management system going forward but we were thinking a lot of volunteers that are going to cross over would probably be the ones in Europe so doing more of like a European landing page where people can sign up and then we add the races on as just an individual opportunity yeah rather than yeah a and i suppose if you page. were that infused you'd probably know 
when the race is going to be oh anyway. My, God, my and... inbox is just people really? messaging me going, hey, can I come back and volunteer with you? I'm like, yeah, sure. Amazing. Yeah, and then people reaching out to us on LinkedIn and stuff. I was like... going to ask you actually whether or not you feel like you have to start again every race with another group of people because yeah. I suppose like just for context, a lot of the customers for Rostify and, and just non-profits in general, they would have probably a core group yeah. that they can always rely on. But if you're traveling you're the traveling circus as you say yeah do you feel like yeah you start to see the same people or is it a little bit like mm, it's like fresh every single time yeah i think that's part of our challenge and that's so i mean like kind of jumping back a few years my love for like the volunteer world was kind of born when i worked for england hockey and they've got such an amazing volunteer program called the hockey makers and this is basically what you're talking about i had to do like no work at the events my hockey makers would come in and they'd run the whole thing and they'd been around like years and years some like there was a hockey maker called alan and he was basically at every event and he ran the pitches there was a hockey maker called annie and she used to play for england was still playing for england in the over 60s and stuff and like amazing. they're literally a part of the fabric of yeah. england hockey and yeah it was like that i'd be ringing them going like hey are you coming to this event and they'd be like of course i am yeah, I've, I've, already already my, I've already got my i've already got my hotel book <laughs> and like that's kind of the volunteering world that i had seen yeah, before i started yeah. at formula e mm -hmm. and it is incredibly different and i think as you were asking earlier like what the calendar looks like we're still really early and like a lot of the races that we're going to do each year are new races. So mm. even though we were in Rome and Italy last year, we're actually moving tracks to Misano this year. Mm. We've got Tokyo, Shanghai, which are first year races. But we've also got the races like Mexico. We're pretty established there and we're starting to see some of the workforce coming back every year. And I think the part of the volunteer program that's really important to me is starting to upskill people, starting to have repeat volunteers that they can just slot in and they can be your supervisors and they can start taking on some of that workload. But we're not quite there yet. So it does kind of feel like every race is new. Yeah. And that's part of the challenge. It's quite not draining, but having to like one week you're engaging with all of the people in Sao Paulo and you're trying to enthuse them about Formula E and like brief in what Formula E is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you're doing it again a week later. So, yeah. 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 It's quite I think it'd probably take a little bit of time to build a community. But it sounds like you'll get there in, yeah. in the end anyway. And these are passionate people. 100%. And that can only help you. Yeah. Like, I suppose people circle around and support a cause when maybe they have been touched by something that the cause stands for, yeah. whether it's like cancer or, or something like that. And it's very easy to feel connected to that mm. and zone into it. And I suppose sport is none less passionate. Yeah. But it's a different, it's I a think completely that, different. Group, yeah. I, I think what's quite hard about this. <laughs> the job I'm in at the moment as well is when I first started, I was like, right, what's our demographic? Yeah. Why do they want to volunteer with us? Who are they? And like, no one had really thought to talk to them or like get any data off them. So I was basically starting from scratch when I started. So a massive piece of work for me over the last like year or so is actually just like understanding who they are, mm. the demographic of the volunteers that are working with us, why they want to volunteer with us. Is it because of sustainability? Is it because they love motorsport? Is it just because they love volunteering? Because mm. I want to talk to each of those people in completely different ways as well. How are you doing that? How are you gathering? <laughs> <laughs> A lot of it is post-event surveys. So uh -huh. we send out a survey link that goes to our insights team. We have an amazing insights team. Like so much of what we do in terms of our strategy and p what pushes us forward is based off really pretty robust like data insights. Yeah. So we've got a really strong insights team. And is that communication out... managed through Rostify? So when they finish a the shift, you can fire yeah. up communication and that might yeah. have a link to a survey and do it that way. Yeah, absolutely. So. At the moment, we're sending the link out via via Rostify to the volunteers, and then we just email it via an agency to the paid staff. Yeah. But obviously, that information going forward would be a lot more easily accessible on Rostify just using yeah. the data on there. I think that's one of the challenges that a lot of charities, nonprofits, and sporting federations have got is that they've got very little um, visibility. Mm -hmm of what the makeup of their volunteer demographics actually are. So how can you possibly recruit effectively if you don't know who you're Exactly. To? And when you're trying to build out a reward and recognition program, you can completely miss the mark. Mm. Like, do people want pin badges because they're like mad volunteers and they just want to like, you know, add the pin onto their, yeah. <laughs> their roster in a way. 
or is it someone that loves motorsport and would want i don't know even like a autograph session pit lane walk sure. after that like the way that you reward those people is completely different and the way you keep engaging with them like would they want to do viewing parties or yeah. would they want to come and learn about more about our sustainability work so i was going to ask you about gen z and female volunteers and all that yeah. as well and i suppose with that visibility mm. comes like identifying potential gaps mm -hmm. where you, where you might have a need to fill do you feel that there's a gap of female support and volunteering within formula e or is it just seems pretty even like... so it's interesting we had like a report coming through from i think it was the rome race and it said like over 60 percent of our rome volunteers last year were under 25 which is really exciting and they're it's young great. it's the next gen um exactly we know these gen <laughs> love the environment don't we <laughs> that's it um but also looking at the data from all of our like volunteering opportunities in season nine and season 10, it's looking at pretty much a bang on equal gender split, which is also quite exciting. That's so great. like motorsport in itself, obviously we're not seeing mad representation no. of women. However, when you kind of go behind the scenes, there is quite a lot of equality and it's interesting. How interesting is this? The gender split of our volunteers is exactly the same as our gender split of the Formula E staff at head office. All right, so, so behind the scenes, yeah. not behind the wheel. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that yeah. is interesting. Because I was going to ask you about like what you think Formula E is doing to two things mm. push women into leadership roles mm. within the organization yeah. as well and the importance that that has yeah. but then also i know that people like susie wolf who's very outspoken within the motorsport industry and and within formula e and formula one yeah they're pushing female drivers a lot as mm -hmm. well and i'm seeing that everywhere are, yeah. are you noticing yeah. that behind the scenes and all that that that's a yeah that's and a the, like in all honesty there are conversations about how we can have women more involved in formulae we want women formulae drivers we absolutely do we can do all of the work elsewhere but i mean from my side obviously i have no sway or control over there but mm. the work that susie wolf is doing in terms of like the f1 academy is absolutely incredible i don't know if you saw this week f1 academy had a new partnership with charlotte tilbury which is a makeup brand which is so exciting i mean like it shouldn't be big news like a makeup brand and like a really female brand is partnering with the f1 academy yeah but it is i love that you've received that positively because it's so because <laughs> it, it could so easily go wrong couldn't it with something well, like that. it'd be like... like girls love makeup and they can love motorsport like I it's lo not... i'm not saying that yeah they can't. but i think just... it's just yeah it, it is pretty exciting that, yeah, that is. collaborations yeah. happened and i think it's only going to do good things to get more like motorsport into more girls lives yeah absolutely. but i mean like aside from the f1 academy Susie Wolf also, I don't know if she's MD or like founder of Dare to be Different, which is about getting more girls into motorsport as well. Excellent. Dare to be Different has led into an FIA initiative called Girls on Track. This FIA initiative is at all of our FE events as well. Mm. And Girls on Track is basically about engaging with girls from the age of, I'm pretty sure it's like eight to 18. Yeah. We do on the Friday at all of our races, we do career talks from like women in motorsport at high level. So I think our VP of sustainability, Julia Palais, she would do a talk at some of these girls on track things, but then they basically just talk to women in motorsport, have career talks with them on the Friday. And then on the Saturday, they have activations and basically just show girls about the breadth of opportunity for women in yeah. motorsport. They just and, need to see it, right? You yeah, need to show so that exciting. there's a path to walk. Yeah, and, and walk it doesn't it, necessarily yeah. have to be getting behind the seat of a car. Mm. You can be passionate about motorsport, but not want to be a driver. You just want to yeah. live and breathe yeah. like, motorsport. But there's also like, aside from like what Susie Wolf is doing, there's like really great podcasts and movements. So, like, I don't know if you've heard of like females in motorsport, girls across the I grid. I have seen that on Yeah, yeah. and then actually Because I stalk you all over LinkedIn. <laughs> I, I can see who you're being interviewed by. <laughs> you've rumbled me. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, it was girls who eat, breathe and dream motorsport. Wow, Jeff, okay. our CEO, did a podcast with them last week so like there's so many cool initiatives and yeah. like movements i'm, I'm out wondering there. if you're gonna see much of that then in your volunteer pool like are we gonna start to see a shift where you can measure the demographic and now it's more leaning girls. over more yeah. girls yeah maybe <laughs> it's quite interesting you say that actually so i've been actually working with girls on track so it's basically our partnership team that kind of push girls on track in turn and bring it to our races but um i was basically saying to them i was like there's a really clear pathway that I see here because we start engaging with the girls at eight. 
but then we have to stop in the girls on track program at 18 guess when my volunteer program starts at the Wonderful. age of 18 yeah. so i was like it makes absolutely no sense for us to stop talking to them then yeah at this age they want to be getting real world experience potentially at our events why don't they come along and volunteer with us and get involved in our volunteer programs so we're looking at that and then looking at aside from like the volunteering roles a bit of work experience opportunities as well so definitely something that we're looking at for the next few seasons i love that i love that link between nurturing an interest in motorsport Mm -hmm. and then not just leaving them to just fly away Mm -hmm. like you've got a group of really interested people in the motorsport and we've got loads of really exciting opportunities at all of our races and like they can really see how an event happens and like a lot of the roles are super fun as well mm. so like our um volunteers one of the most popular roles is them being in like the gaming arena so for anyone that likes motorsport and gaming it's mm. a really exciting opportunity for them as well so yeah like the esports stuff so the gaming arena that we've got is it's basically these sims that you you know you pretend you're a driver and you go around the track so it's like a sit-in sim but you know like drivers like 90 percent of their like training time is on a sim yeah they just sit in a dark room yeah that's it. <laughs> so just it's basically just one of those sims yeah, yeah literally yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've got an event that's happening in march in london which is focused on how to get gen z engaged in the volunteer program yeah so you you guys are already doing a lot of work within that mm-hmm. as well Where, what is gen z like does that start at like age i'm not sure i know that they like billy eilish or whatever her name yeah. is that's how... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's how you know. If you can identify, like, so we I've... need to get Billie Eilish along to one of our races. I, if and we, she's there. I think if you could get Billie Eilish into, <laughs> such a boomer. <laughs> if we can get Billie in a car, then I think you'd be definitely increase the reach of your. I'll write that down. Program. and I'll text so you if that happens. Yeah, that, that's how. That is the scientific way you identify as Gen Z, is if you know that. So that's. <laughs> So that's good. Well, we had Usain Bolt at our race in Mexico. Did you see that? Oh, he's as old as I am. I know, but it's cool, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that is good. Right, so can we talk a little bit about Rostify? I kind of want to keep yeah. it kind of light, <laughs> not, though. But, like, what prompted the move to getting Rostify? Were you involved in it there already when you joined your role? Or how did that come about? I'm trying to remember the series of events. I initially got to know about Rostify, um, which I was saying earlier, when I was at England Hockey. But then when I started at Formula E, I'm pretty sure that someone in the event experience, so I sit within the event experience team, someone in the event experience team had left just before I'd left, had been looking at the volunteer program and about how to kind of improve it. Mm. And obviously one of the main things was to get a volunteer management system. And they'd identified and had a few initial conversations with, I'm pretty sure it was Shannon. So that's kind of how I reached back out to you guys. I mean, obviously a volunteer management system kind of helped fill all of the gaps that I had in terms of like understanding the demographic, retaining, finding new volunteers, Mm. and then also just like helping manage the volunteers as well yeah and like you say they really do make every event as well so 100%. investment in something like that i think is well i can't really say this because i'm yeah. incredibly biased <laughs> but yeah but investment in in the you're in good company yeah. <laughs> investment in the systems that you use for that yeah. is really important to make sure yeah. that they get a consistent and rewarding experience Absolutely. every single and time it's been quite nice because it hasn't been I feel like sometimes when you're talking about volunteers, like people go like, oh, they're free, aren't they? Mm. And you're like, actually, <laughs> they take a lot more time, but they also like, there is a lot of resource that go into bringing that many people on, but also making sure that they're having a good time with you as well and retaining them going forward. So yeah, absolutely so important and valuable, but also I haven't had much pushback from anyone informally. I think everyone else understands and sees the value which is really nice and quite Mm. refreshing as well even Mm. people that don't work in workforce often it's like you know when people like in the volunteer world (laughs) we're all like you see me i love volunteers too (laughs) like but no one else gets it but um i don't know i feel like at formally there is a recognition of the importance and what they bring to the event as well Mm, but that's good that that's being recognized and it doesn't surprise me Mm -hmm. but um was there any particular challenge that you know that you needed solving that we did a good job of? And I'm thinking like um, scheduling on like a global scale or the large volumes of applications that you might get or just, mm. oh my God, I'm drowning in admin, please save me. Mm-hmm. Like, is there anything that stands out that you think like, actually, that really was sort of like an unexpected game changer for us? 
in all honesty, one of the things for me, which is probably quite different to what every everyone else that uses Rostify. Everybody says that. It's <laughs> the fact that you're like a global company and you basically have, I don't know the words, like the systems and like the legal stuff in place that kind of takes that all away from me and my legal team mm, we care a lot about the legal stuff <laughs> yeah but that's so for example when we went into tokyo and we were talking about rolling out a volunteer program the local team in tokyo were like super nervous about data protection mm -hmm. and they basically didn't want to touch a volunteer program because when you use a, an agency they take care of all that themselves they contract those people it's like completely different when you're using volunteers and yeah, the local team just didn't want to touch the volunteer program because they were super nervous about this aspect. And we were like, don't worry, Rostify takes care of it. <laughs> so that for me, I was just getting emails like every time we were doing a race about like data protection, the different challenges in each market and yeah. spending so much time talking to legal teams, which was actually taking up so much of my time. And I can empathize yeah. with the anxiety on the other side of that because you don't want to get this wrong no. because publicly it can be embarrassing, Absolutely. particularly for large corporations and that. And we, we house the data that we've got in the countries where the event is taking yeah. place as well, which solves mm -hmm. so many problems, but isn't actually that common for a lot of platforms as yeah. well. So thank you for saying that. Yeah, <laughs> no, that was definitely one of the big selling points for us. So random question. So you've got 10 events mostly throughout the year. You go lots of different places. Where has the worst food? Where has the best food oh, when God. you go on your tour? <laughs> John's quite hard. Like I used to be vegetarian, okay. <laughs> but this job is like makes that quite hard. <laughs> so mm. I'd say the worst experience for me was like I was having breakfast in Jakarta, and I thought I was eating rice, and I looked down and it was loads of little worms with eyes. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so I was, that nice. gave me the ick a little bit. But, but, then, but before you realise, was it nice? Like, did you enjoy? It was quite it? salty, okay. which is why I was like looking at it, and I was like, oh my god, it has eyes. I wouldn't yeah. say I enjoyed it before I realised. <laughs> no. Did you finish it? No, no, no. no okay. No. Right. Which is a shame. Yeah. I think they that's one of the... died for me. <laughs> but one, one, of your, one of your main things for your role, right, is to travel the world and experience I... different cultures and, and yeah. see lots of things. So... I ate, ate three mouthfuls. Okay. Well, you, you're doing your I try bit. everything once. Yeah. <laughs> Where has the best food? Obviously Rome. Rome. I knew yeah. you were going to say Rome. Well, just like... cheese and pasta, man. <laughs> You can't go wrong. I shall I think out the where else have we been? Obviously Mexico. Yeah. Tacos, so good. Yeah. yeah. When you travel, do you have to travel quite light? Or are you there for such a long time that you need to take like loads and loads of suitcases and like yeah. you're moving out every time you do a race? Or is it a bit like <laughs> I mean, I used to pride myself on being a really light packer and only taking hand luggage. Hmm. I've completely changed that now, but it's because, you know, I said like we're a bit of a travelling circus. We are basically in build phase until D minus two. So we need steel toe caps, need a hard hat, need all your PPE. Mm. So that's basically half a suitcase before you even started. But also like so lucky to go and travel to so many of these amazing places. And when you land and you're operational straight away, you don't actually get to go out and see the place you're in. So I try and always extend for at least a day or two. But when I was like a few races last year, I had the opportunity opportunity to extend for like a week so and I love cycling so I've got to take my helmet and my cleats and my everything and my pedals <laughs> hold on do you put a bike on the on no the I rent the bike when I'm there but I would take my own like pedals and what are they like the, the fancy ones that you clip onto your boots and that yeah oh you're such a snob <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I don't want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> I get it eventually. What would you like to see more of in Formula E? Volunteers! Volunteers, <laughs> good. So, I mean, as I've said, like, volunteers take a lot of time and effort. Rolling out a volunteer program would probably trickle my workload as opposed to doing paid stuff in a market. I don't mind doing the extra work because I love it and I love what the volunteers bring to the event. But it is just the reality that I can't do a volunteer program in every market at the moment. I just don't have the bandwidth. And like, I don't want to do a rubbish volunteer program. I don't want to give it my everything. And um, if I was to roll one out in every race now, just go, I would be worried that I wouldn't be able to give the volunteers everything that I'd want to give them. Mm. And is there anything that you'd like to see less of? It's quite hard. There's a lot of challenges when we're going into our races at the moment, because a lot of times I'm entering a track for the first time on the Monday and I'm delivering mm. 
at the end of that week. Mm. So the time that we're leading into it, that it's quite hard to build out like a really robust, like accessibility program for each race to make sure that every single one of our races is as accessible as possible. We're getting some third party come in to do, um, we had an audit back in London last year and we're working quite closely with level playing fields to make sure that all of our events are as accessible as possible. So I will acknowledge at the moment, we're not completely accessible at all of our events. And that is sometimes the challenges based on the circuit that we go and race in. Like maybe they don't have a bridge hmm. over, they don't have a lift in a bridge that goes over a track, which sure. means that not all of the track it's is accessible. Yeah. So then we try and work to do track crossings at certain times in the day, hmm. which isn't ideal because it limits the movement across the track and for those groups at certain times in the day. But something we're working on and definitely pouring a lot of time, effort and resource into making sure all of our events are as accessible as possible. Do you get homesick when you do that much traveling? <laughs> do you know what is really hard? So like, <laughs> you're always just having loads of fun. <laughs> right. You have a fun team. I feel like I you do. I don't want my boyfriend to hear me answer this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all the time. I don't really get homesick. And I think part of it is because I'm literally... I go to more or less every race. A lot of people would only work on like three races a year, but they would be out there for a month or two. Mm. Whereas I go out to every race for a week and a half. Mm. So like I land, I'm operational, really busy. And then I have one or two days to enjoy myself. So I don't really have time to be homesick. Yeah. And I'm back for two days and then I'm in a new place. So everything feels new. It's not just mm. me in a hotel for like a month with nothing to do. And also it means that I'm like with different people every few weeks. Yeah, and in the off seasons, I presume yeah. there is an off season for you there guys, is, yeah, right? There is, yeah, quite yeah. a chunky one actually for now. So what happens if to- If the your... calendar doesn't bulk out too much. <laughs> what happens to your volunteer program and what you're doing there between the off season part of it as well? I mean, I think not even just in the off season, obviously we are in a race location, racing for one day mm. or two at the most. So it's not even just like in the off season, it's like I'm delivering a volunteer program in Mexico, giving all my time and energy to that. And then the next week I'm in Diria and I can't, don't really have time to think about what I did in Mexico. I'm straight onto Diria and then like I'm straight onto the next one. Hmm. So there is definitely a lot of work in terms of staying engaged with volunteers throughout the year. We want to try and do like viewing parties where we can get the volunteers together to view other races get them involved in, I don't know, like sustainability projects that we might have going throughout the year in each market. But it's definitely a piece of work that we can add to. And like, in all honesty, like when August comes around, I like to take a month off. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> I need so a holiday. Everyone. Yeah. Where do you go when you go on holiday? Can you travel all over the world? Do you just like go to Bedford or something I mean, like that? I went to Norfolk last year, actually. <laughs> Yeah, Norfolk's great. No, I'm not knocking Norfolk. It's just that when you... No, yeah, no, my boyfriend was like, oh, should we go on holiday for a month? And I was like, where? And he was like, let's go like long haul. Let's go. Yeah, let's South go to America. Mexico. Yeah, and I was like, can we go to Norfolk? I was like, I don't want to get on another flight. <laughs> I think that's fair. Thank you very much yeah, for going through that and telling us about your volunteer program. We're absolutely chuffed to bits to have you as a customer and we mm -hmm. really enjoy working with you with you guys and we're excited to see how your volunteer program grows and we obviously want to be a part of that thank you for letting us be part of that in some way no thank you thank you so much for listening to the engaged volunteer podcast 